live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE, covering Cisco Live Europe. Brought to you by Cisco and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to Barcelona, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host Stu Miniman. John Furrier has been here all week. Day three coverage of Cisco Live Barcelona. Cisco Live, EMEA, and, and R. We learned the other day, add R for, for Russia. Kostub Das is back. KD, he's the Vice President of Product Management for Data Center at Cisco, and he's joined by Kevin Egan, who's the Director of Computer Systems, the Computer Systems Group for Data Center, also from Cisco. Gents, good to see you, welcome to theCUBE. Thank yes. you, great to be here. Thanks Katie, for having us. KD, Data Center was the real, a real focus of the announcements this week. Uh, the data center is exploding to a lot of different places. What's going on in the group? It's been a terrific week, and you're right, Data Center was uh, a core of a lot of the announcements this week. Um, and as we kicked off the keynote with this concept that the data center is no longer centered, it's really the, the data moves to the edges, the data center is moving to the edges. We had a lot of um, announcements around Hyperflex, Hyperflex Anywhere, this product that we've been innovating on like monsters uh, within a very short time, gone from a New, brand new product in the market to, uh, to a magic squadron leader with Gartner and really kind of doing a lot of industry first with that. So that, that's been a big focus. Um, we had a lot of announcements with our technology partners because we not only innovate within Cisco, but we work with, with Pure and NetApp and Citrix and Intel Optane and NVIDIA to bring products to the market that get the richness of their innovation and our innovation together. Um, the other big focus has been all about programmability. Uh, you know, as, the, as, as, as this world becomes much more programmable, focused DevOps, automation, um, it's been around inner sight and programmability and taking that uh, to, 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 to the next level. Interesting, so of course we always talk about shipping you know, five megabytes of code uh, 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 as opposed to shipping petabytes through a straw in, yeah. into the, you know, the God box, but so Kevin, uh, programmability is a key theme here. We're, of course, we're in the DevNet zone. Yeah. Uh, we had Susie Wee on yesterday, and she was just talking about the evolution of Cisco infrastructure and how early on you guys made the decision, let's make all this stuff programmable. And that was sort of a game changer. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, it's been amazing. The growth of just Cisco DevNet, right? We've got half a, half a million um, developers now developing um, against you know, our, our, our SDKs, our DevOps, our opportunities all across our Cisco platforms. Uh, we've got thousands of Cisco resources doing work on that, producing those libraries, producing that, you know, those uh, sample sets of code and, and contributing to the communities. Um, and today, our customers are using it in a way that they've never really done. You know, previously it was a, a, a sort of a fix because uh, vendor tools weren't getting it done. And now they're using these automation uh, tools to really do everyday tasks out to the mass um, to, to reduce you know, the complexity for their teams and, and reduce the burden. And then of course to have you know, that repeatability and that security and that compliance aspect. And it's been amazing, the explosion. Yeah, uh, the simplicity reminds me back you know, the, the earliest days of UCS. You know, UCS was built for you know, that wave of virtualization, and as Katie's talked with us uh, this week already about some of the partnerships that you've built, you know, the, the wave of converged infrastructure, UCS really dominated in that marketplace. But I hear now, we talk about you know, AI with some of your partners, you talk about mm -hmm. programmability, it's like, that, that's not the Cisco UCS that you know, I remember launching. So maybe give us you know, the update specifically, what was announced this week, you know, where, where, where the platform has gone uh, in more recent days. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I can start, maybe can, yeah, we can lead absolutely. on. Um, UCS came up with this concept of everything needs to be programmable, everything needs to be an API, and, and maybe we were a little ahead of our time. You know, we, we conceived of this in 2007, you know, got the product out in 2009, and really from the very genesis of the program, uh, from the, for, of the UCS program, it's been a programmable platform. It's been, everything's an API. The, the, the UI makes calls to the API. Our SDKs make calls to the APIs. So that's been the core platform, and in some ways, it feels like the industry is, uh, is coming to where we thought it would come to a little bit earlier. So the, the, this whole concept of infrastructure as code, uh, you know, software defined, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, this, is, this was core and germane to the, to the, to the product itself. What we've done lately is, is taken that policy 
uh, that we had encapsulated and taken out of the server into the fabric for scalability, we've taken that now into the cloud. And, and what that does is it, it leads to that, that velocity of innovation becoming even, even higher. Um, the ability to create new and unique use cases becomes higher, just the ability to consume it becomes higher. And all of that, um, coupled with where IT is going, which is becoming much more DevOps, uh, much more around automation, I, I think those, those forces are coupling together to create, create some really unique use cases. You, you said, you gestured, take it into the cloud, which is interesting, You're pointing. What does that mean, taking it into the cloud? So, uh, let's peel back a little bit. So, what we, what we started out with was, listen, a, a server's a box. We need to abstract the server, the personality of the server out of that box into policy, put it in the fabric. And that allows us to really scale that and, and give, 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 give the box different personalities depending upon the workload. What we've done is we've launched a product called Intersight. Intersight takes that policy and makes it a, a, a SaaS service, a, a management as a service we want to call it. So now, as data moves everywhere, as data centers move everywhere, as our applications no longer become monolithic but become these, these combinations of little applications communicating across data centers, it allows us to have a centralized dashboard for our infrastructure that we can access because it's in the cloud from anywhere and because it's in the cloud, it can kind of get, uh, get that innovation uh, wheel turning much faster. Uh, it's, just, it's just been game changing. And obviously there's other things that can, that can happen once you do that. Uh, you can have proactive guidance coming down from the cloud. You can have um, you know, uh, golden images coming down from the cloud. You can do workload specific settings. So there's a lot of new areas that it opens up once you, once you do that. Analytics, so. right? We're Analytics. Machine intelligence. So we, we've got the takeover happening in the DevNet zone right now. So focus on the data center. Everybody's got t-shirts. I think it says HyperFlex on them. Big announcement this week about right. HyperFlex Anywhere. Kevin, you know, I, I think that the peop when people heard HCI, they often picture a box, or it's a group sure. of boxes, it's in a rack, it's all that and everything. And, and the thing as an analyst I was poking at is like, well, we virtualize a lot of stuff and we put it in a new form factor. That, that's great to modernize the platform, but how do we make it cloud native? How does it fit into a hybrid and multi-cloud world? And it feels like we're, we're reaching that point now. So help us, help us connect the dots as to how, you know, what HCI was, you know, fits into this hybrid and multi-cloud world today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, HCI, when it came out, was an alternative to SAN. Right. I mean, it was an alternative, and, and it, was, it was touting simplicity, touting, you know, grow with your, your applications. Uh, but really now, with the multi-cloud um, instances that our customers are looking at, you know, they have to have a way to deploy those, a way to connect to those remotely, manage those, monitor those, actually connect that back to the core so that you can take advantage of you know, the analytics that are running at the core and make real-time recommendations, make real-time uh, adjustments for services, and those type of, you know, that connectivity is really what we mean by, by HyperFlex Anywhere. Okay, I mean, yeah. it's, it's the evolution <laughs> of how you deploy, how you manage, and then of course that day two, day five, day 100, where you're actually making that experience simple for the customers. In, in, in Help us understand exactly, is this, do I just have a backup image in a public cloud? Do I actually have you know, similar software stacks? You know, yeah, what, let me, let me, let me yeah. try to unpack that a little bit. I, I, think, it's, I think it's three different vectors yeah. that, that we're doing. So, we want, as we modernize, and our, as our customers modernize, they're looking for a much more cloud-like, nimble, elastic platform, right? That's the first vector. That's, that's, what, that's what HCI has done, that's what we've done. And we've actually done it on, on steroids because we've, we've taken that co-designed hardware and software, much like the public cloud guys are doing, but we control that and we can, can, we can give that to, to our enterprise customers in an enterprise-grade resilient infrastructure. The first thing is that. Second piece of it is what our, what our customers and our really our developers and the customers are wanting to do is, is to create in one place and deploy in another, right? So create create on the private cloud, deploy in the public cloud, or create in the public cloud, deploy in the private cloud, or actually have applications that bridge the two. So having a homogenous uh, development environment, whether it's, uh, and, and a lot of this is around the container frameworks, whether it's on the public cloud, private cloud, that's key. And what we've done with Hyperflex and the integrations we've got with uh, our container platform, with OpenShift, uh, with Cloud Center, which was again a big uh, announcement this week, that's that second vector, is being able to port applications, 
develop one place, deploy any place. Uh, and the third piece is what we've been talking about all through, the, through this, this segment, which is uh, the ability to now have the cloud drive your infrastructure. Everything's connected, everything's analyzed in the cloud, there's telemetry, there's proactive guidance, there's a common dashboard, there's centralized monitoring, uh, there's the ability to deploy like we did in the keynote, uh, just demonstrating the keynote, multiple different sites spread out across the world uh, from a central location. I think, I think that's, that's, you know, it's game changing. I'd like to get your take on differentiation. Obviously, you guys are biased. Cisco's different, it's better, but I want to hear why. So, relative to other infrastructure players, are you, in your words, however you want to describe it, more cloud-like, more programmable? Where's the differentiation? Yeah. Uh, go ahead and I'll, I'll let it Yeah, on. sure. I, you know, so basically, you know, we started with the foundation of UCS and, and that foundation for, you know, virtualized compute, bare metal compute, and of course now hyperconverged. Uh, and the reason that it allows us to do things, uh, allows us to hyperflex anywhere, allows us to have that cloud-based model, is because we built that infrastructure around the API from day one. When we started this, uh, that programmatic infrastructure, we were talking to customers, it was stateless, it was desired state config, they didn't know what we were talking about. I mean, they had no idea this, you know, when this came out. But that's the foundation that really allows us to drive the API integrations mm -hmm. to our uh, app layers, which is what Katie was talking about, and then of course from there to our multi-cloud multi uh, integrations. And that, that's really the foundation that, that, laid, that we laid early on, and that's why all of our UCS platform really enables this cloud integration. Yeah, I mean, you know, the way I look at it is nobody else has a fully API-driven infrastructure. No, everything's an API for us. We don't, we don't expose APIs after the fact. It, it is built around, it's an API-first infrastructure and everything is built around that, whether it's our SDKs, our integrations with you know, Puppet and Ansible and, and those kinds of tool sets, uh, it, our, our, our uh, integration with other, other tool sets that people use, it's all driven through that. The second thing that is different is we have an emulator, so we can allow our customers to really, really time travel through the whole process of deployment. I mean, our customers can deploy the infrastructure before the infrastructure hits the loading dock because they can download the UCS emulator, they can actually configure, deploy, build the whole policy on, on, on our management uh, uh, platform, test it out, do the what ifs on the emulator. When the equipment shows up, it, we're ready to go, we're in business. Nobody else, nobody else can do that. Um, and that's the, that's the final thing, which is, uh, aside from you know, all, all of the cloud connected pieces I've talked about, the breadth of Cisco's portfolio spanning from all of our networking assets, our SD-WAN assets, security assets, our collaboration assets, uh, our cloud assets. That breadth gets us to implement use cases uh, for our customers that are, that are just, it's, it's just impossible for anybody else to do. Mm. Yeah, uh, we've heard lots of proof points here in the DevNote zone specifically from programmability and the automation. Um, I've talked to some service providers here at the show. We've talked, heard about the journey that enterprise customers are going through to kind of understand that space and learn places here like this. Kevin, I'm, I'm sure you're talking to a lot of customers here. Yeah. Maybe if you have some examples as to, you know, the exemplars of who are doing this well and, um, yeah. you know, what people can learn from customers like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? And just DevNet alone, we've got sessions on UCS with Python, you know, SDKs, UCS with PowerTool, how to integrate with Ansible, you know, and these, these are just becoming common terms, common household terms for our customers. As you go up the enterprise customers, service provider customers, they're using these tools in a day-to-day -day manner to do the automation on top of, you know, to really deploy and manage their apps. Right, and, and the way that, uh, I mean, it's exciting. We have customers from all segments of all industry, uh, and they really, they use these programmatic, you know, KD's simple example of, of platform emulator. I mean, you don't realize how powerful that is, where you can set that same exact state machine that's in your UCS, you can put it on your laptop, set up all your policies, and then when that gear hits the dock, you are up in hours. Li literally, we have, very large e, you know, e-commerce sites, mm -hmm. they do this, thousands of servers hit it, and in a matter of hours, they've applied those, you know, applied those policies and they're up and running. Um, Python, you know, we've got Python, Ruby, PowerTool, software developer kits, we've got DevOps that sit on those, that, you know, in Ansible, Puppet, Chef, and, and these are just the automation. So it's, if you want to do it yourself, 
We've got the world-class API. Nobody else gives you that programmatic API. We've, we've, that's how we built our foundation. If you want Cisco to call those APIs, we have Intersight, and you know, we'll make those calls for you. If you just want to do some simple scripting, power tool, you can automate certain processes. It doesn't have to be the whole end-to-end. -end. You, know, you can use all these, it's basically choice uh, to really what your applications are demanding and what your customers are demanding. Yeah, it's a strong story, one of, one of breadth and depth. Uh, we're out of time, but Katie, I wonder if you could sort of put a bow on Cisco Live Europe this year. Big takeaways from your point of view. <clears throat> Listen, we've been innovating like monsters and it's, it's such a terrific week for us to, to, to come here to really touch and feel and listen to our, our customers and see the delight on their faces as we show them what we've been doing. Um, and, and this part of, of the show, the third day three, the DevNet takeover, this is where it gets really, really real because now we get to go down to the depths of looking at those APIs, looking at those use cases, getting people to play around with them. So it's just been terrific. I mean, I, 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 I love it. I love it. That's Stu, we're the interview monsters this week. So guys, <laughs> thanks very much for coming <laughs> on theCUBE. Thanks it's great for having to see us. You. Yeah. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE from Cisco Live in Barcelona. Be right back.